Well, good morning. It's good to have everybody here. Welcome to everybody in-house and everybody that's watching online. Uh, I want to open this morning uh, with a time of prayer. I got notification this morning that we need to pray uh, for Daryl and Rebecca Wiggins. Uh, Re Rebecca's mom passed away last night, and uh, um, we want to pray that the Holy Spirit would comfort and guide and, and give wisdom uh, to the family. So why don't, why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes. We'll acknowledge the presence of our master in this place, and, and then we will, uh, we will pray for Daryl and especially Rebecca. Father, thank you for never leaving us and never forsaking us. God, we thank you in Jesus' name for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you because you have been so good to us and you've blessed us so richly. And some of our family is grieving over the loss of their family. And we ask, Father, that you would comfort them, that you would minister to this time of loss. I understand it to be the first close family member lost on that side of the family. And Lord, we understand the pain. We understand the grief. And we just ask you to dry every tear. We ask you to bring back great memories. We ask you to bond family together, heal old rifts. Father, in Jesus' name, may your word, your gospel be ministered to those that don't know you in this time of hurting. And may those who do be uplifted and encouraged because of your goodness. Tend to Rebecca's weeping heart this morning, I pray. Give Daryl the wisdom to be a good husbandly comforter. Father, as we delve back into your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint what I say and that you would open the ears of the listeners and that as we explore portions of your scripture that as a church body we've never spent time in before God, I pray you would open the eyes of people's understanding and, and make this a joyous, worshipful experience of understanding your word. And the body of Christ said, amen. <clears throat> well, we are continuing our series in the book of Revelation. And we are definitely in uncharted territory now. At least as far as this body is concerned. We are into Revelation 6. And this segment, Revelation 6 through 19, is really the climactic story of God's plan, his redemptive plan for all of history. So let's review the homework that I gave out last week. Hopefully some of you found time to engage in some of the homework activities, <coughs> excuse me, for, for your own edification. I reassigned the reading of Daniel chapter 9, and I said go back through our two sessions on the 70 weeks of Daniel. I did a post for everybody who didn't get a chance to do that um, in both of the, uh, the local TC group and the, the broader uh, national, international discipleship group, what you want to call it, where those links are readily available to you, two sessions on YouTube. And then just familiarize yourself and outline uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That's one of the most important prophetic pieces of Scripture anywhere in your Bible and it is something that you want to have a working familiarity with, despite the fact that you may need to go through the information a few times to really grasp it. Then, of course, I assigned reading chapter 6. We're going to be spending the next few sessions on Daniel 6, or uh, rather Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the sealed scroll. And the reason we're going to do that is, like I said, this information for many of us is new. We haven't covered this ground before, and it it gives us the opportunity to explore portions of Scripture in ways that we otherwise might not. So I don't want to miss those opportunities. Um, I spent the entire day yesterday just studying God's Word, not just for, for the preparatory purposes of, of what I want to uh, speak on and present to you to this morning, but I started to uncover things that I had never seen in the Word before. And let me tell you, it never gets old. And I'm not even going to be able to get to them. I've got to lay groundwork to even get to the stuff that I want to show you. Um, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how we do it here. It's, it's like Mr. Miyagi. We paint the fence. 
we, we, we wax the floor one line at a time, you know, and just we build, we build the print one principle upon another. But my goodness, it, you know, I've been at this a while now and there is still nothing more exciting in my life than when I see the word of God open up to me in ways that I've never seen it before. It never gets old. And uh, I am super, super excited to, to dive in to some of these portions of scripture. So without further ado, let's do that. <clears throat> let's remember when it comes to Revelation 3, if we can put the scriptures up on the board, um, that this book claims to be special. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. This is a book that literally says, read me, I'm special, made by no other individual book in scripture. And yet it is a book that terrifies most people to try to understand. We have been dealing with this subject called eschatology, the study of last things for quite a while, and we've got a long way to go. Um, and I just like to review topics from time to time. <clears throat> Hermeneutics is the, your theory of interpretation is all that big fancy theological word means. And the bottom row on that chart that I have on your screen, whether you're on the left hand of the slide, which is allegorical, or you're on the right hand of the side, which is literal, determines on, on your view of Scripture. Do you take things to be literal or do you take things to be allegorical? And depending on which side of that scale you slide to will determine the views that you uh, have. If you take a very precise, a very literal, that doesn't mean that we think everything in the Bible is literal. The Bible actually has over 200 different metaphoric uh, types of speech in it. We recognize it, but, but we mean we handle the text very precisely. That leads to the view of pre-tribulational rapture, a pre-millennial stance that Jesus has not returned and the millennial reign of Christ hasn't returned yet. And the further you slide on that chart, you will either wind up being uh, post-millennial or amillennial. Uh, amillennial, of course, being like atheistic or agnostic. There is no millennium. It's all metaphorical. Uh, and, and we've covered those views in different sessions. I need not go into more detail there. Revelation 1.19 is really the outline of the book. Jesus, in his vision to John, tells John, write the things which you have seen, which is the vision he just saw of Christ in chapter 1. And the things which are, which becomes the seven letters to seven churches, comprising chapters two and three of the book. And the, the things which shall be hereafter, that which follows the churches, chapters four through 22. The reason we divide it that way is the very first word in chapter four, verse one in the Greek is metatauta, and that is hereafter. So the things hereafter literally begin with the word hereafter in the Greek. Not that complicated. In fact, here it is. After these things I looked, says verse 1. And that word in the Greek is the same as hereafter in uh, chapter 119. Meta tauta in the Greek. After these things. Now, <clears throat> we went through all of that really quickly because I also want to spend a little time reminding you of Hebrew hermeneutics this morning, which is a hermeneutic hermeneutic or a theory of interpretation that falls by the wayside when you look at most scholars' commentaries. The reason for that is they have adopted a very Greek mindset. Uh, one way we can see the Greek mindset is that prophecy is the way the Greeks viewed prophecy. It is uh, a speaking and a fulfillment. And of course, the Hebrews didn't work that way. Yes, that was one aspect of prophecy, but to them, prophecy was a pattern. Uh, that's why we talk about things like the theory of expositional constancy, that symbols in the Bible, even though it was written over a period of nearly 1,500 years by 40 different people, the symbols are used symbolically the same way. They don't change what they mean from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It bridges the two. It links the two. <coughs> and that's unique among books from antiquity. Well, Hebrew uh, hermeneutics actually is fourfold. We saw a great example of this when we did our 14-session uh, investigation of the churches because we saw that each of those seven churches that Jesus wrote an epistle to had four levels of application. They had 
you know, the, the literal application. It was a real church at the time. They had an admonitory application. This is what the church universal needs to watch out for. It had a homiletic or a personal application that we could apply to our individual lives. And then it just so happened that because those churches were given those names and they were, the letters were written in that order, that they had a prophetic profile. And that prophetic profile tells the story from the end of the book of Acts till you got out of bed this morning. It is amazing. And uh, too many coincidences to not be true. So Hebrew hermeneutics is four levels as well, and it's actually quite rigorous. It's not the haphazard, allegorical, symbolic interpretations that other people who look at Revelation like to have. Um, the idealist or even the preterist interpretations of the text can be very haphazard in their interpretation of symbolic meaning. Hebrew hermeneutics, however, are very rigorous. They take a very high view of the text uh, in their translation, in their interpretation. And the first level in Hebrew is known as Peshat. At least that's how it would be transliterated if I didn't, uh, if I put the Hebrew characters on the uh, um, uh, word for you. And uh, that means the direct, the literal meaning, much like we said with the churches. Then you have, and excuse me, I left out an E in the transliteration, the Remez which is a hint of something deeper, akin to an X marking the spot of a buried treasure. It's, it's a hint that something more may be there. And I've often told people, anytime you see a contradiction in the text, pay very careful attention because it is not there by accident. It is there by deliberate design and it typically means there's something you want to pay attention to. And we saw a great example of that when we compared Jesus's Olivet Discourse from Matthew 24 to Luke 21, which we'll review in a moment. <clears throat> the Darash is the homiletic or the personal application of the text, and the Sod is the deep, hidden, or mystical meaning. And so as we move our way through the balance of the book of Revelation, I'm going to keep trying to call back to these different levels, not necessarily exhaustively, or we would never look anywhere else or ever finish this series. There's just so much. You can go back year after year after year and find more. But remember these. Um, it, is, it is important. So with that said, Let's enter into chapter 6, what happens after these things, the opening of the seven-sealed scroll. And let's review some key principles. And that you're, you're really going to begin to see why we took that break at the end of Revelation chapter 3 before we started Revelation chapter 4. And I taught all of these different doctrinal segments from other portions of the Bible that deal with end times or that deal with prophecy because if you don't have a grasp of some of those things, then I would have to teach it all now instead of just being able to call back to it in places. <clears throat> so I want to call your memory back to a group of signs that Jesus references in all of, his, in all of the Gospels except John. It's referenced in Matthew, it's referenced in Mark, it's referenced in Luke, and it's all in what is known as, as Olivet Discourse. There's some key differences there. Matthew and Mark are essentially the exact same telling of that preachment. Luke, however, uh, when we examine it, we find is very different. It's not even the same place where he's speaking. It's not the same audience where he's speaking. Uh, Matthew and Mark, he is, uh, of course, speaking uh, at the temple. Luke, he's speaking to the disciples on the Mount of Olives the next day. And then what we're going to see here, and when I did our couple of sessions on the Olivet Discourse, which you can go back and refresh yourself on, I referenced that we would see this same group of signs in Revelation 6. So because we're entering into Revelation 6, we need to see them here. What does it mean? We see false Christs or deceivers. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see famines. We see deaths. We see martyrs. And we see global chaos all laid out. And these first six seals of that seven-sealed scroll we examined in our previous two sessions on uh, Re uh, Revelation chapter 5, that seal, that title deed to the universe the first six of those seals correspond to this group of signs. <clears throat> Let's go back to Matthew 24 and read a few verses just to refresh our memories. 
It says, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. <clears throat> and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I want to put that in your mind because we're dealing with the opening chapters. In a sense, what we are dealing with is the beginning of the end, but it's not yet the end. Okay? And a lot of, we're going to be presenting you with some information that um, is even going to run contrary, because we always do. It's kind of my thing. Um, is going to run a bit contrary to what other futurist premillennial scholars would teach because they like to teach that as soon as the first seal is opened the beginning of the seven-year tribulation has to start right then i'm going to posit something a little bit different that makes a little bit more sense i'm not going to be dogmatic about it because hey we don't know but we're going to put forth a slightly different model that i think everybody's going to find helpful it certainly is opening my eyes in a lot of places. But that's just a hint at what's to come. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 7 through 9 says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. Today they're trying to blame that on climate change. I'm going to blame it on prophecy. <laughs> All these are the beginnings of sorrows, he says. And see, that is very key, because that is where Jesus names this group of what we could essentially call non-signs. Why do I call them non-signs? Because Jesus just said they're not the end. They're signs that you're close, but they're not the actual signs that my impending return is going to happen just yet. It says these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to that then, that comes after that on your screen. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That's Matthew's approach. This is the distinction that I would even venture to say that 95%, maybe 99% of all eschatological scholars and commentators who try to talk about Bible prophecy miss. Why do I say that? Because I only know of one that gets it right. And that's the man that taught me. But they miss this one tiny little difference between Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So now let's now jump to Luke 21, verse 8. It says, And he said, Take heed that you may not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go down after them. It sounds like it's the same preaching, but at a different gospel's version of it. Matthew recorded it one way, Luke recorded it the other way. It's the same stuff. We don't have to pay attention to differences. We just need to harmonize the gospels. No, let's, pay, let's, let's take a high view of the text. Let's assume that God says what he means and means what he says. It says, but when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Same Phraseology. <clears throat> but when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but then the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Pay careful attention to Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, deliver up to the synagogues and prisons, and be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Well, Matthew said after these things, then these things will happen. Luke is saying before all these things even start to happen, they're going to do this. So it's going to happen before it happens. You're going to get persecuted before and you're going to get persecuted after. Good news. You're going to get persecuted two times. In fact, what is a very confusing point to 
many scholars as Luke 21 32 says assuredly I say to you this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place assuredly I say to you this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place Matthew 24 34 it causes a problem because Matthew 24 says this generation meaning the generation that sees two things the abomination of desolation Matthew 24 goes on to talk talk about and the great tribulation but oddly Luke 21 talks about the destruction of the temple and scholars get really confused because how could the same generation that saw the destruction of the temple see the great tribulation when the destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD and futurists say like us say the great tribulation hasn't happened yet it's yet future well obviously the generation that saw the destruction of the temple under Titus Vespasian has been a worm buffet for a long time now how do we get there two different audiences two different preachments two different purposes In Luke, it says before all these things, what things? The wars, the famines, the earthquakes, etc. That group of non-signs that Jesus refers to in both places as the beginning of sorrows. That's one generation because they'll be persecuted before those things. And that's the generation that saw the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Matthew goes on to say then after these things or then you will be persecuted after you see this group of non signs and he warns about the abomination of desolation and he warns about a period of tribulation that comes upon the earth that will be unlike any time that has ever happened to any nation ever before it and he says this generation surely will not pass away to the coming of the son of man comes two different generations if you understand that distinction all the bad commentary on end times teaching starts to vanish because you can begin to spot where they start to make bad leaps of logic because they don't understand the distinction of the two Does that make sense that's why I can't stress nailing the two sessions we've done on the Olivet discourse know it till you can preach it like I do and people won't be able to confuse you this is key to understanding end times prophecy so key so then let's review a few things about the term weeks in the Bible <clears throat> what does the Bible mean when it uses the term weeks well there's a week of days that we see in Genesis because of the creation week then because of the Feast of Weeks instituted in the Levitical command for the Feasts of Moses, <coughs> there is a feast, make sure I got that on right, there is a feast of, or, that takes place after seven sets of sevens, there are 49 days, and then on the 50, 50th day they have the feast of, called Hag Ha Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, or in Greek, Pentecost, so that's another set. Then you have a week of months because from the month of Nisan to the month of Tishri, you have a seven-month cycle of the Mosaic feasts or the feasts of Israel. So that's a, a week of months. And then Leviticus also establishes a week of years or seven years equaling one week because that leads to a sabbatical rest for the land. In fact, there's a, even a series of sevens on that that adds up to 49 and then 50, which is called the year of Jubilee. So when we get to the 70 weeks of Daniel, the point that I bring that up is in that prophecy, he's not talking about seven-day weeks. He is, in fact, talking about weeks of years. That's what uh, the prophecy concerns. So Daniel 9.24 talks about the scope of the prophecy from the restoring of the land uh, or the command to go back and restore the land to the coming of the Messiah. That's the scope. And that will take 69 weeks, or as Daniel puts it, 62 plus 7. And then we have an interval, a gap that takes place in verse 926. And that interval is implied in many places in the scripture, up to and including when Jesus is sitting in the tabernacle, stands up to read from the great scroll of Isaiah, and stops at a comma. And that comma, of course, where Jesus chooses to stop is is all about his first coming 
What he leaves out from the verse in Isaiah is, and the day of the wrath of our God. He leaves that out in his first coming. And so far, that comment that Jesus chose to stop at when he quoted from the text and astonished everybody that was in there by saying, all of this has been fulfilled in your sight, that comma has lasted 2,000 years to date. And then, of course, the 70th week of Daniel is the most talked about period of time in the entire Bible, the last seven years. Let's read a few of these verses together. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, that's how we get to 69, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And then it says, and after the 62 weeks, so after the seven and the 62, that's after 69 total, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, cut off in the Hebrew or even in the Aramaic of, of Daniel, it's karat, means killed. This is a prophecy that the Messiah would die, that the Jews missed. The Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and end the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So we're talking about this interval period. On the one hand, we have the 62 weeks. Then we have the cross and we have the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and all of that period of time in between. And we come to what is called the 70th week here in verse 27. It says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, the prince who shall come. That's the title of the Antichrist. But in the middle of the week, what is the middle of seven? Can anybody tell me? Three and a half. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So this 70th week, it is the most documented period of time in the Bible. It, technically, the wrath of God gets poured out in the middle of the week. We see that in Daniel 9, 25. We see it discussed in Daniel 4, 16, 23, 25. It's referenced as the day of judgment. It's called the wrath of God. And we see many, many places in Hebrew where it's given this three and a half year designation. Times in Hebrew comes from a term that is a dual, later lost in the Aramaic, means two. We don't really have dual to the closest we get to a dual term in English is like the word both, to have two of something. It's not the same as a plural because a plural is, in fact, more than two. It's three or more. They have that in Hebrew. So in other words, when we see that phrase time, times, and half a time used in our Bible, it's actually time, one, two, and half a time. That makes three and a half, right? Or three and a half years. <clears throat> it's the same length, actually, as Jesus' earthly ministry. We see three and a half years again in Daniel 9, uh, 12, 7. It's called 42 months in Revelation 11, 2 and 13, 5. Same period of time. 1,260 days in Revelation 11, 3 and Daniel 12. Or I think that's actually supposed to be Revelation 12, 6. Um, and half the week, Daniel 9, 27. It is often called the day of the Lord. In fact, it's called the day of the Lord 20 times in the Old Testament prophetic books. Three times in the New Testament, Acts 2, 20 which references Joel 2.31 and then 1 Thessalonians 5.2 and 2 Peter 3.10, very commonly used term. It's called the day of God in 2 Peter 3.12. It's called the day of the Lord's wrath in Zephaniah 1.18. So you can see there's a lot. Why do we call it the most documented period of time in the entire Bible? Because it talks about it a lot, this phraseology called the day of the Lord called the day of darkness in Joel 2, 2, and Zephaniah 1, 15. So let's talk for a minute 
a little bit to bring us out of where we are at in Revelation chapter 5 and into where we're going. There is a sequence of events that has to take place. Now, once this sequence of events takes place, then the tribulation can begin. So last time we saw the 24 elders and the seven lampstands, where were they? In Revelation 2 and 3, they were on the earth and Jesus was standing in the midst of them, writing them letters and giving them admonitions. He was commending them for things they had done right and he was addressing concerns he had about things they were doing wrong. That's Revelation 2 and 3. The lampstands are the churches. Those menorahs are the churches. Then in Revelation 4, where are the lampstands? They are now inside the Holy of Holies of the universe. The whole picture is of the Holy of Holies of the temple. And there are the seven lampstands because that's where the menorah sits, right? And then there are 24 elders, which we determined through exhaustive study. There was a lot of people that the elders could not be. But they are called kings and priests, which is what Jesus says he makes of his church, kings and priests. So the 24 elders are a complete representation with the lampstands. They're in heaven when the tribulation begins. The lamb doesn't receive the seven sealed scroll until after the 24 elders take off their crowns and place them on the glassy sea. And again, that glassy sea solidifying. Remember Jesus walking on the water, Peter wanting to come out to him, his loss of faith in the moment causing him to sink. But now we see the picture, the sea is solidified, the sea that Jesus walked on, they're all walking on now because we're perfected in our faith when we get to heaven. Tribulation doesn't begin until the lamb opens the seal. So the tribulation can't begin until the lampstand and the 24 elders are in the throne room. The lamb doesn't even receive the scroll until the elders lay down their thrones. And the tribulation can't begin until the lamb opens the scroll. That sequence of events has to take place. It's very important. In Revelation 6, 16 and 17, we are going to see that it says, For the great day of the wrath of the lamb Wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 10, 7 says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. Revelation eleven eighteen 18 says, And thy wrath is come. Revelation 15, 1, Seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of of God. Revelation 16, 1, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16, 7, it is done. This segment of the book that we are going into is the description of that last period, that seven year period, wherein the wrath of God is actually poured out upon the earth prior to the consummation of of all things. So let's look at the 70th week, a little bit different. Doing pretty good on time. <clears throat> the period under consideration from Revelation chapter 6 through 19. We had those 69 weeks, and then you can see now I've shrunken down the interval a bit where we see the cross and we see the destruction of the temple. Then we have this period here of the 70 weeks, and that's described in detail in the next several chapters of the book that we are going to go through, the next 14 chapters. <coughs> now, the traditional interpretation of that is that when the prince who shall come comes and enforces a covenant, it's taking place during the 70th week. Somewhere in the middle, he erects this idol in the Holy of Holies of a reconstructed temple. We'll talk more about that later on. But at the three and a half year, 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, that's when it happens. And then technically, even though most people reference it as the full seven year period, and, and that's fine because this is the last week of Daniel. But the wrath of God is really poured out for those last three and a half years. And then we have the second coming. Jesus returns. Why does he return? Because remember, Israel is going to look upon whom they, him whom they've pierced. 
They're going to recognize Christ as their Messiah and repent. And when they collectively repent as a nation for missing Jesus as their Messiah, that is the triggering event that causes Jesus to stand up off of the right-hand side of his father's throne because he's not seated on his throne right now. His throne is the throne of David and exists in Jerusalem. He's seated on his father's throne. And when he comes down, he hits the Mount of Olives. He splits it in half and returns to finish the battle. Now, <clears throat> Matthew 24, 21 and following speaks of this period known as the Great Tribulation. It says, for then there will be great tribulation. Hey, that's why we call it the, the never mind, you get it. Such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jesus is referencing something that is talked about in Daniel 12. 1. He says, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 is where we get another of this period's names that tells us that it's exclusively focused on Israel. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's other name, of course, is Israel, Isaac's son. Abraham's grandson, but he shall be saved out of it. <clears throat> now, Hosea 5.15 is a curious verse for an Old Testament verse. God speaking, he says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. First question you always ask yourself when you read this verse is how can he return to his place unless he already left it? This is talking about Jesus returning to heaven. This is talking about the ascension because he had already had to leave his place in order to return to it till they acknowledge their offense. What offense? Not acknowledging Christ as the Messiah. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. The judgments that are being poured on Israel during this time are so that Israel will repent of the sin of not acknowledging Christ as the Messiah so that he can return to the earth. This is the order of events as most pre-tribulational, pre-millennialist futurists would lay it out. At the end of the interval, we have the rapture, the harpazo, the catching away, the disappearance of everyone who is born again, the first fruits of a new creation in Jesus Christ. We go to meet him in the air. That's another whole study. If you have troubles with that, we've provided a three-session lesson on the rapture for you. They head up, and the first thing that takes place is what is called the Bema Seat Judgment. And judgment in that phrase, we'll, we'll discuss the Bema Seat in a little more detail later on in this series. But it's not judgment in the sense of, are you worthy to get into heaven? The worthy have already been caught up through the Harpazo. This is the awards doled out. This is like the Academy Awards that people will actually want to tune into. This is, this is the show where... Based on the works you did for Christ, once you were justified by his blood, you are rewarded good for those things that you did well. This is the good and faithful servant moment. That takes place, and then after that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, one of the things that is really key that we discuss here is when we did our rapture series, and even when we talked about this in our last two series on um, Revelation 5, we saw that it was a br that, 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 the, that the contract, the seven sealed scroll, was really a marriage contract. It was a ketubah. That's the, the Hebrew term for a marriage contract. And Jesus is, is getting ready to redeem his bride in both roles that the goel play in 
the Old Testament Levitical purpose. One role of the Goel is the kinsman redeemer. That's the Boaz from the story of Ruth where he comes in and he redeems Naomi's land by taking Ruth as his wife and raising up an heir to Naomi's son, Ruth's husband. That, that's two Levitical laws in place there. It's the law of Leverite marriage, and it is the law of redemption of the land. And Boaz fulfills that because it was the nearest kinsman who had to be the one to fulfill that. But the other aspect of the Goel is as the avenger of blood. He was the nearer kinsman who had to avenge murder in those times. And we've talked about sanctuary cities and the role of the avenger. But we've also said that we need to look at Joshua and overlay Revelation on top of it. Because Joshua is really a picture of Jesus dispossessing the kingdoms of this world. And making them into the kingdoms of our God in Revelation. You can read those two books in tandem and see all kinds of parallels. But the marriage supper in a Jewish wedding ceremony is interesting. It lasts seven days. It's, you, we think you're tired of the marriage by the time the reception is over in an in a American wedding. Go home. We want to get to the wedding night. Leave us alone. No, it's a seven-day feast. And interestingly enough, I want to take you here real quickly because a lot of people say, well, you're just, you're just pulling that from... Um, you're just pulling that from tradition. You're not actually getting that from the Bible. No, that seven-day wedding feast is actually in your Bible. I don't have it on a slide, but if you go to Genesis 29, and you start at a verse 25, this is, of course, the story of uh, Jacob getting married. And as we all know from the story, he wants to marry, uh, he wants to marry Rachel, but uh, his, Rachel's father tricks him. And so, so it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. Imagine you woke up in the morning after your wedding night and you found out, oh, that's not the girl I signed up for. And he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Pay attention to what he says in verse 27. I tell you what, fulfill her week. And we will give you this one also. He had to fulfill the week of the marriage supper for Leah before he could marry Rachel. The seven-day marriage supper is right there in Genesis 29, 27. You can see it for yourself. We don't make this stuff up, my friends. So that's the typical situation. And as we just saw, just a little bit zoomed in on this, on this slide... 3.5 years of false peace, 3.5 years of great tribulation with the abomination of desolation there in the middle. And then, of course, the second coming and Satan is bound and Jesus rules for a thousand years. And then we get to the last parts of Revelation. So all of that said to say this, let's zoom in a little bit on the seven sealed scroll. What are the seven seals and what happens when they are opened? That's what we're going to be looking at as we dive in to Revelation chapter 6's actual text after the break in the next session. So we have the seven sealed scroll. And what you're going to see is, again, we've discussed over and over that there's a very heptatic structure to the book of Revelation. Seven churches, seven stars, seven lampstands, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven thunders. There is a sequence here of sevens. But as we continue to work our way through chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, 14, 15, and 16, what, what I want you to pay attention to is there's always six, and then there's a break, and then we get to the seventh. So for instance, we are going to see the first six seals opened in Revelation chapter 6. That's what Revelation chapter 6 is all about. But then there's this parenthesis, which is the entirety of chapter 7, where the book shifts and talks about something totally different. And then we get to chapter 8, and that is the opening of the seventh seal. And the opening of the seventh seal cascades and causes angels to begin blowing seven trumpets. That's what happened, okay? But as we get to the seven trumpets, there's six, and then there's a break, 
for a little bit. Chapters 8 to 9 give us 6. And then we have chapters 10. And we don't get to the seventh trumpet till chapter 11, verse 15. It's just like, yeah, you've had enough of the trumpets for a little bit. Let's do a little drum solo. Then, after the seven trumpets, we get to seven bowls. And even in that, there is a slight little one or two verse parenthesis where it just takes a break before we get to the seventh bowl judgment. I tell you that kind of stuff because I want you to be able to stay grounded as we move through this text. If you understand the design, you won't get confused. So it's always six, and then a parenthesis, and then a seventh. The seventh opens up the next seventh, and then the, uh, um, there's six, and then the seventh opens up the next seventh. I'm even going to give you a reason why uh, this kind of happens, but I think I'll, I'll wait to do that into the beginning of the next session. So let's zoom in a little bit closer and look at these first seven, the, se the first six of the seven seals. <clears throat> the first four, anybody know what they are commonly referred to as? The first four seals? They are commonly referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay? They're probably the most commonly known. Anybody who has even a passing knowledge of Revelation typically understands the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the green horse. Some people call it the pale horse. We'll, we'll look a little more detail at that in the next session. So that seals one through four. Then we have martyrs. And then we have cosmic changes. And so if I go back to where we were at at the beginning of this session, and I showed, showed you this group of signs, we see false Christs, wars, famines, death, martyrs, global chaos. Well, if we go back to those first six signs, we see deception, we see wars, we see famine, we see death, we see martyrs, and we see cosmic changes. And that is why I submit to you that those first six signs may not actually be the beginning of the seven-week tribulation period. It may be just the beginning of sorrows because they mimic. And what did we learn about the beginning of sorrows? All of these things must happen, but the end is, what? Not yet. Now, why do I say that? Why do I think that that's important? This is what I hinted at at the beginning, and it's kind of the thought that I want to wrap up on with this session to introduce it to you and kind of let you meditate on it for a little while. The question is, when does the clock start? Is the 70th week of Daniel triggered at the moment of, of the rapture? That is by far the most common understanding that most pre-tribulationist uh, teachers out there that you're going to find are going to give you. And we're not going to be dogmatic about it. We're going to suggest a slightly different arrangement, and you'll see what I've done here. There could be a gap between when the rapture happens and the beginning of the actual 70th week of Daniel. Why? Because we see that the rapture itself could trigger what Christ calls the beginning of sorrows. Why? Well, let's think about it for a second. Let's say even 1% of the population of the planet are Christians. If the rapture doctrine is true, that means in America alone, 3 million people will disappear overnight. Something tells me, even CNN, MSNBC, they're just going to have a hard time covering that one up. Facebook and Twitter may block coverage. But it's going to be hard to cover up. It's especially going to be hard to cover up because even the jaded 
European news or uh, news from other parts of the world, they're going to have an even bigger problem because globally that would mean 70 million people disappear overnight. And the world is going to need to have an explanation for this. And the first thing the enemy will do is deceive people about why it happened. Is it unfathomable to believe that wars will erupt when people disappear? Is it unfathomable to believe that Famines could break out, that diseases could happen all over the place. Is it unfathomable to believe that those who convert to Jesus Christ after the rapture and start ministering the gospel could be persecuted and martyred for going against the belief that it was a mass alien abduction? Is it possible that then global chaos could erupt in that place and that gap could happen? There are some good reasons to believe in that. In fact, I have a handout for you. Do you have that handout? We're going to give it out. I don't necessarily agree with everything in here, but I'm going to give you 10 reasons. You can study it on your own. For those of you that are online, we'll put a link to this article in the comments that suggest with a really good biblical basis that there may be a gap. Maybe it's three months. Maybe it's three years. But that it's going to take time for a world government to assert itself. It's going to take a little bit of time for a one world religion to assert itself. And maybe this gap between the rapture and the beginning of the actual tribulation could explain how that happens. I am certainly more comfortable with it. But to those who would say that it can't happen, I'm not going to be so dogmatic as to say that it all can't happen in seven years. Some people would be dogmatic. I'm not going to, it could, it could all start and everything we see from Revelation 6 to Revelation 19, it could all take place in seven years. And what do I say to people say that's impossible? It's really easy. Your argument is just hashtag 2020. We have seen in the last year how fast things can change. Maybe if this were two years ago or three years ago, we could continue to have doubts and say it's absolutely impossible that all of this could happen in just seven years. But I think if we're honest, we, those of us that were thinking about what we were going to accomplish in 2020 in October of 2019 never saw any of 2020 coming. And a lot happened that changed a lot of our lives really, really quickly. So I'm going to say it's possible. The gap theory could be wrong. Read the information that I've given you. We'll tap into more of it as our series goes on. But I just wanted to provide you with some more information because I'm pretty convinced uh, that, it, that it's highly likely that there's a gap of time there. The gentleman in the article suggests that maybe it's a three-year gap of time there for some pretty good biblical re reasons. Check it out. Study it for yourself. We will get into the text of Revelation chapter 6 and specifically tackle the first four of the six seals contained therein after the break.